today when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, we hear about many different kinds of drivers. We hear about driverless cars, we just heard about auto autonomous vehicles, we hear about smart cities, we hear about uh, cloud robotics, we hear about the industrial internet, and uh, on the other hand, we hear about other drivers like big data and the fact that we are moving from products and services to an outcome economy. All of these are specific drivers of various ways in which the economy is going to change. What I wanted to spend some time today is talk about the, the most important aspect in which the fourth industrial revolution and the IoT era and a lot of other changes in the economy today are going to be different from all the industrial revolutions that have happened before this in the past. So with that in mind, I just want to spend a very small uh, period of time talking about the previous industrial revolutions. We know about the previous three industrial revolutions. The first industrial revolution, the primary force that drove it was steam. The discovery of the steam engine drove it. But what I want to stress is not on the primary force that drove these industrial revolutions, but the primary mechanism in which each industrial revolution changed the way value is created. The way labor and resources are managed in order to create value. With the discovery of steam, the first thing that happened was that for the first time, labor could be replaced by mechanization. It could be replaced by machines. And so the key aspect in which value creation changed in the first industrial revolution was through mechanization. In the second industrial revolution, the primary force was the discovery of electricity. And what that changed was that for the first time, we could create supply chains, we could create, we could enable division of labor, and that ensured that complex tasks could be performed with high efficiency because we had this division of labor. So the supply chain was uh, invented and uh, over time it was optimized, it was made more and more efficient. In the third industrial revolution, which is what we associate with computers, the key shift that happened was not that we moved from physical to digital or from uh, traditional models to computerized models, but the fact that for the first time, we could use logic and programmable logic to create value. In the first industrial revolution, we created machines, we organized them into supply chains in the second industrial revolution, but only in the third, we could start programming them to start performing automated tasks in a certain manner. What's happening now is in the fourth industrial revolution, we're taking it a step forward, but it's actually a giant leap forward because fundamentally the way business is, uh, the way value creation happens is changing between the third and the fourth industrial revolution. In the fourth industrial revolution, we're not just doing programmable logic, we're actually digitizing every possible object every interaction with that object, every workflow in which that object participates, and we're using all of this data to create intelligence that not only improves all these processes, but fundamentally reorganizes every process. And that is why I believe the most important aspect of the fourth industrial revolution is not the Internet of Things, it is not connectivity, it is not digitization, it is the fact that today, finally, we, can, we are moving into a, 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 an economy where networks are being orchestrated, and the companies that orchestrate these networks that connect things with each other and enable them to be reorganized in new ways to create value, those are the companies that are going to be the most successful and the most powerful ones in this industrial revolution. Let's talk about that a bit further. I first got interested in this whole shift. When we're talking about this shift from the third industrial revolution to the fourth industrial revolution, I first started getting interested in this shift around five or six years back when I used to run innovation for a Silicon Valley-based firm. And in, in, during that period, I started trying to understand what was the real shift happening in the economy. A lot of people at that time believed that the real shift that was happening was that we were moving from physical systems to digital systems. But that is not true, because if we believe that we are moving from physical to digital, and if that is the real shift, then we come up with all kinds of erroneous uh, implications. Some people said that in the future we won't have shops, because everything will be online. That never happened. Today what we're seeing is not physical versus digital, but physical digital hybrid models. So the shift was not from physical to digital. Some people said that the shift is from dump to, to data and to intelligence. But I believe that there's a much deeper shift that's happening, and that's what I wrote about in the, in the two books that I brought out after that, Platform Scale and Platform Revolution. 
I believe that uh, the fundamental design of business itself is changing. And when I say that, I want to explain what I mean by that. The traditional design of business is what I think of as a pipeline. This is how business has always worked. You have a producer who creates value, that value is shipped and it goes to, the, to a consumer at the end. All supply chains work like this. Traditional media companies work like this. Content is fed down a pipe and it reaches a consumer. Traditional service models work like this. We've always had this straight line model of business, a pipeline model of business, where value is created and it's pushed downwards. In the first 10 years of the internet, what we uh, think of as Web 1.0 and the transition to Web 2.0, most of the disruption that happened because of the internet was a pipeline disruption. A, uh, an inefficient pipe was replaced by an efficient pipe. Think of retail. Amazon disrupted borders, or Netflix disrupted Blockbuster. The fundamental design or the fundamental mechanism of business did not change. It was still a retail model. Instead of an offline channel, they used an online channel. Think of newspapers that got disrupted. Newspapers had a high cost of delivery because news had to be printed and there was a cost to transporting that printed news. And when that moved online, the cost of delivery became zero. So the entire newspaper industry got disrupted. So in the first 10 years of the internet, we saw what I would think of as pipeline disruption. But what we're starting to see right now, and this is where the fourth industrial revolution comes in very importantly, is that we're moving to a new model of business, which is a platform model of business. The best way to think about the platform model of business is that fundamentally the design of business completely changes. We looked at the pipeline model of business. The platform model of business looks like this. It's not a straight line anymore. Today, the companies that are the most successful are the ones that create a platform on which producers from outside and consumers from outside can come in and start interacting with each other and create value on top of the platform. You take any industry, if you look at what happened in the telecom industry and the handset manufacturing industry, Nokia and BlackBerry used to work in the pipeline model. They would create different kinds of handsets, they would uh, load them with applications, and then they would push them out into the market. What Apple did was it created a platform. It created just one phone and then allowed developers to come in from outside and start creating apps. So today, all of us who own iPhones over here, actually we bought the same phone, but we all have different phones today because all of us have personalized it with the applications that were available in the ecosystem. The same thing has happened in other industries too. If you look at any industry, when the source of value in that industry gets digitized, there becomes an opportunity for a platform play to come in. When the smartphone came in, it created an opportunity for cars to be digitized, because for the first time, location could be a digital value. And because cars could be digitized with smartphones around 2007, Uber happened around 2010. And Uber came into being only because the fundamental value in that industry, the location of the car, had got digitized. What we are seeing today, and the reason I believe this is important, is because across industries with the IoT, we are starting to see the fundamental value in every industry starting to get digitized. And so increasingly, we'll start seeing industries being reorganized from pipeline models to platform models. If you look at this shift, when we look at the first three industrial revolutions, all of them worked in the pipeline model of business. The big thing that changes when we move to the fourth industrial revolution is that the companies that bring all these digitized objects onto a network and create a platform to manage their interactions with each other, these are the companies that are going to be the most powerful. Today, GE is trying to do this. Globally, GE is trying to create a platform for organizing and coordinating the way industrial systems behave. Companies like Bosch are trying to do this, where, where they're trying to imagine what manufacturing could like, look like in the future, when supply chains stop behaving in the pipeline model and start behaving like supply networked ecosystems. And so the, the opportunity, that, the biggest opportunity that is there in the, in, in, in the fourth industrial revolution is not in putting sensors into things, it's not in creating things that are connected to the internet, it's actually in building these network orchestration models, which are called platforms. And that is what companies like Bosch and GE are trying to do in their respective industries today. 
There are two specific things that change when we move from the pipeline model to the platform model. The first and most important thing is that instead of competing on the basis of resources, we start competing on the basis of ecosystems. If you take the traditional model, if you take, for example, Nokia or BlackBerry, they used to compete on the basis of the product, uh, products that they had. So Nokia, for example, would create 40 different phones, and that is how they would differentiate themselves. The uh, Apple differentiated itself not on the basis of the product, but on the basis of the developer ecosystem that it created around that product. And so the reason Apple became successful was not just because the iPhone had the capacitative touchscreen, but because there was an ecosystem of developers around that. And if you take it down to what's happening today in different industries, what will increasingly happen is that traditional industries, which have always uh, worked on product superiority, on resource control, they will start moving towards ecosystem-based models. I'll give a few examples of how tr industries like mining are moving in this direction, how uh, manufacturing is moving in this direction shortly. But one key shift is this shift from products to ecosystems. A second important shift is that instead of focusing on process excellence, we will start focusing on interactions that are happening between different products that are connected to the platform. So when we reach a stage where driverless cars are all connected to the platform, we will try to figure out how can we make the interactions between driverless cars more efficient? How can every driverless car learn from all the intelligence that is being gathered by all the other driverless cars? We will stop focusing on how can we make every individual car more efficient at fuel optimization and things of that sort. We're increasingly going to start focusing on interaction excellence rather than on process excellence. So when we look at this, there are three categories of industries that I see today. There are industries that have already moved in this direction, which are the information-intensive industries. So if you look at the media industry, it's already moved in this direction. We, we call it social media. If you look at the telecom industry, it's already moved in this direction because of Apple and Android. A second shift is happening today, which is that regulation-heavy industries are moving in, in this direction. If you think of banking, if you think of healthcare, if you think of education, these are all industries that are heavily regulated. And because regulation is high, it's very difficult to reorganize interactions between industry stakeholders in entirely new ways. Because all kinds of questions start coming up. Are consumers going to be protected? How do you determine the uh, veracity of a third party? All of these kinds of questions start coming up. But increasingly, we're starting to see with the rise of fintech companies uh, and with the rise of healthcare data companies, these industries are also being affected and are moving in this direction. But the most interesting shift that I believe is going to happen is in the resource-intensive industries. And that is where the Internet of Things becomes really important, because as things start getting connected to the Internet, the fundamental way in which industries work will completely change. Let's take an example of what's happening with mining today. Mining is moving to a model where we'll start seeing autonomous mining happening. Traditionally, mining has been a people-intensive uh, activity. You spend a lot of time uh, prospecting. Once you prospected, you send people into the mine, and they, they, they are people in the mine, they are people outside the mine, they have to interact with each other, and that's how the whole process goes. Today, what's happening is that, first of all, you don't need to send people into the mine anymore, because robots can do the mining for you. This has several implications. First of all, you can start mining in places without worrying about the safety of people, because robots can go in and, and mine over there. So the places that you can mine, the cost at which you can mine, all of those are falling down. But that's just the start. Once you have that happening, the second thing that's, becoming, th that's happening at the same time is that interactions between people who manage these robots are also becoming digitized. And with all the data that the robots are giving and all the data that the people are giving, mining is moving into a platform model where all of this data is being centrally collected and is teaching the robots how to mine even better. It's teaching the other uh, partners of the, of the mining company how to interact with them even better. And so the whole mining operation is being reorganized around a platform. But most importantly, once all this data gets collected, the next step that mining companies are thinking of is about opening up this data so that third party uh, data scientists can come in and start crunching this data, opening up this data to non-competitors, for example, to geologists. All of this data traditionally was either not collected or it stayed within the mining company. And today a lot of value can be created by opening up this data and creating a platform around it. A very similar thing could happen in manufacturing, where there are many different things that are happening at the same time. You have companies like Autodesk realizing that 
quite a bit of manufacturing is going to be uh, an information intensive thing. It's the design that's going to be the critical factor. The actual manufacturing could happen in a plant. It could happen through an additive manufacturing facility. What's going to be most important is how the design gets created and how the design gets shared for others to work on top of that design. So Autodesk is uh, putting a lot of bets on how manufacturing could move in this direction. In the same way, supply chains are becoming more and more open as there's more data being created about which kind of manufacturing partners are good to work with, which kind of manufacturing partners are not that good to work with. Manufacturing, industry, manufacturing plants themselves are becoming more autonomous and are moving in the smart manufacturing direction. Uh, again, a place where Bosch is investing a lot. So we're seeing many different ways in which traditional companies like manufacturing and mining are changing because of what we broadly call the, in, uh, the Internet of Things. But what's really changing is not that things are getting connected, but that the way value is created, the way data is collected, and the way that data is used to create new kinds of value is fundamentally changing from the way it used to be in the past. I want to end this by talking about few, a few key business considerations that are very important when you're working in this new era. The first consideration that's really important is the idea of openness. Today, every company, every manu car manufacturing company wants to create the autonomous car, but all of them want to create their own operating system, all of them want to create their own standards, and because of that, nobody is reaching consensus and nothing is happening. There has to be a mechanism by which interoperability can be achieved for industries to move in this direction. The same issue is happening with in healthcare industries. All the hospitals gather patient data, but they don't want the patient to own that data. And it's actually against the benefit of the patient if the data is with the hospital rather than the patient. Because as a patient, I cannot move from one hospital to the other. All this aspect of digitization is still constrained because we are working in closed environments. So understanding how to become more open and taking critical decisions about what to close is going to be increasingly important. The second thing that's very important is the idea of network effects. And what that means is that as more and more stakeholders get connected to your system, the value of your system improves and increases. Think of Facebook. The more friends you have, the more value you get out of it. Or think of Uber. The more drivers there are, the faster you're going to get a ride. So that's a network effect where the more producers on the system, the more consumers will benefit. And the more consumers come on the system, the more producers will benefit. As industrial systems start getting reorganized around networks, these companies will have to understand how to manage network effects, how to look at factors that lead to the creation of network effects, and how to enable those factors increasingly over time. The third thing that's going to be important is once everything gets connected, you have to create the rules of governance. We heard earlier about the fact that uh, when autonomous vehicles come in, you have to create new rules of governance, new rules of regulating those autonomous vehicles, and how to think about public safety. The same thing will happen once supply chains start getting reorganized in the direction of networks. You need to figure out every time a partner connects to you, how do you govern that, that partner? What kind of rights does the partner have? What kind of data can that partner access? All of those kinds of issues will have to be looked at as well. A fourth thing that's really important is that system dynamics are going to become really important in this stage. Because once things start getting connected, it's not just a linear flow of value. Everything that every object does in a connected system impacts every other object in that system. So you have to keep looking at larger scale effects. You have to keep looking at feedback loops that get created because certain kinds of data are being created and, th and that data then impacts other elements in the system as well. And the final thing that's going to be really important is that all these platforms will scale because they will benefit from machine learning. Think of what is happening to Tesla today. Tesla claims that it is best positioned to get in, into the autonomous vehicles uh, uh, area at this point in time for no other reason except for the fact that it has the maximum number of autonomous vehicles on the road. A lot of data is being gathered from all of those vehicles, and all that data is then being used to train every car to become more autonomous over time. So the companies that have access to the best data set, that use that data set in the best possible manner to learn, are going to be the ones who are going to succeed in the fourth industrial revolution. Bringing all this to a close, I want to say this again, that when we talk about the fourth industrial revolutions, there has been a shift in the driving force that drove each 
revolution. We moved from steam to electricity to computing to digitization and intelligence. But the bigger shift was that the way value was created fundamentally changed from mechanization to supply chains division of labor to programmable logic and then to network orchestration. But the biggest shift, when we look at this, between everything before us and the fourth industrial revolution is the fact that we have moved from a world of pipelines to a world of platforms. And the companies that will win in the fourth industrial revolution will be the ones that will understand how to run as platforms. Thank you so much.